Thank you. So my goal is actually to share with you guys the lessons learned in terms of electronic health record use for research purposes. So I don't have a clicker, so I have to stand here. So here's what I want to go ahead and explain to you guys. So I want to give you guys a little bit of understanding about the current landscape of EHRs. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk about how EHR has been used uh, nationally, internationally, regionally, locally, and at the UT system level in terms of research purposes. And then share some of the thoughts about future direction. Okay, so this is the landscape of electronic health record in the nation. Okay, there are two large companies that basically covers 50% of the electronic health record in the country, Epic and Cerner. Epic is predominantly in major academic medical center. Cerner is majority in community teaching hospital, but also have significant share in teaching hospitals. So if you look at other makes, the remaining 50%, all scripts, Meditech and McKeeson, so the future is going to be with these companies because they are holding millions and millions of patient records than any other company that will ever have that. So just to give you a brief idea about the data aggregation, a lot of you guys, like myself, that's how I started my career in using claims-based analysis. So we as physician will submit claims, and you guys will try to make a story out of it. Okay, so whether that story is right or whether majority of the claims were fraud, you would have no idea. But you will try to make a story out of it that if somebody submitted a claim, actually the care was rendered and this is what happened. And there are some great research that is actually done using administrative claims uh, nationally. The second is using registries. Now, the registries are actually very helpful if you are looking for orphan diseases or there are researchers who already want to identify patients that meet certain criteria and you want to enroll them. So, classic example would be registries for pulmonary hypertension. It's an orphan disease. You have to meet a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So, you have all the variables that you need. So, it will be a clean cohort of patients that you can follow over a long period of time. So, those are your typical registries. Now, clinical trials are main uh, goal pinning for all your um, to study any randomized control trial to see whether drug A works better than drug B or intervention A is better than intervention B. The challenge is they are very expensive and they are not as efficient as other modes. Now the last one is EMR or electronic medical records. So this is data on patient care billing and also some data on quality of care. So I'm gonna share with you guys some of those things and the people are trying to say that, hey, this is a rich data source and one of the main criticism for administrative claims is that it is not refined enough. So we can't understand severity of illness enough, so we need much more data to actually address that. We come up with ways of addressing that in administrative claims, but it's not enough. You know, you can only match for what is cap captured. You can't match for what is not captured. Things like we do for propensity matching, IV analysis, we can only do things that are already in there. So for severity of illness, you know, we look for, like for ICU population, a patchy score or acute physiology score. It's not feasible in administrative claims, so you also have to have a lab data to calculate those. Now, I think one thing to understand is difference between EMR and EHR. People often use them interchangeably as they are the same thing. Actually, they are two separate things. Electronic medical record is just a record of medical care that is managed and maintained by one healthcare organization. So what we have here is going to be an EMR where you get your care. And it is used by an authorized clinician who actually has a right to get into your chart and the data continuity within that same organization. So those of you who are employees here, you have an electronic medical record and your medical record sits within EPIC. Okay, so whereas EHR is a little bit more than that. It's an electronic health record. What it does is it actually has a longitudinality to your record. 
So it will not only capture what is within UTMB, but it will also capture what is outside of UTMB for the care that is rendered to you at other facilities. And it is interoperable across different organizations. So that is truly what an EHR is. Okay, often people use EMR and EHR interchangeably. What we use at UTMB, if we use a research with an EPIC at UTMB, is just an EMR. It's not an EHR. Okay, so EMR data use is mostly uh, care rendered, and, uh, and we went into electronic medical record because we think it actually provides eligible notes. Now the challenge is it's all copy and pasted, so it's often hard to know what is care rendered and what actually happened in that given patient. And another thing is also that it primarily, if you look at EMR, it's predominantly created for billing purposes. I think it was sold as it provides better patient care. I don't think that holds true. Uh, there was a paper that came out today in JAMA talking about actual cost, administrative cost with EMR for billing purposes. And it turns out there's a fair amount of cost even with EMR to actually submit your bills. Because one of the advantage was that if you have an EMR, you just click and bills goes in, there's less paperwork, but it didn't pan out. There's very nice time-based studies done on that. So if you get a chance, you should read that article about actual cost to submit a bill using EMR. Then another major um, a proponent for us, meaningful use. So CMS wanted to put electronic health records, so they created additional funding depending upon number of Medicaid or Medicare patients a given provider or a group of provider creates and they give you a certain amount of money as long as you can report some quality measures. That was in way giving you some carrots so you can adopt electronic health record or electronic medical record. Another thing is it was supposed to be able to report quality measures easily now we have similar thing coming up for physicians. So up to 9% of physician payment is going to be at risk if we don't report on what's called as MIPS and MACRA. These are quality measures that are attributed to physicians. So that is the way they were able to overcome the SGR formula where physicians were up to 29% reduction in their uh, claims. So they said the only way to fix it that we won't cut anymore, but we will go ahead and pay you or take money out of your pay if you don't report on quality measures. So that's what the EMR is currently being used for. Now let's talk about what, what is nationally um, going on in terms of EHR for biomedical research. Now here are the three examples. One is eMERGE, which is electronic medical records and genomics. So there are 10 U.S. medic centers that are participating in it. This is predominantly to have electronic medical records, some clinical data, and also do some genome-wide association study. So this is eMERGE. Number two is SHARPEN, which is a strategic health IT research program. This is also to come up with a better way of identifying data. So one of our challenges, we all actually put information very differently. I'll type my note very differently than Dr. Abate, okay? So he may type diabetes care the way he wants, I'll type the way I want. You will never be able to pick up what I'm writing or what he's writing. So Sharpen is pretty much to come have a group of institutions together, and I'll share that slide with you later, to come up with a unified data dictionary, how we are able to put data into EMR or EHR. And the last one is EHR for CR. This is predominantly, I think CTSA people will like that. This is predominantly in Europe, but this is to identify phenotypes of patient that meets criteria for clinical trials. So this is your eMERGE. eMERGE is based off of Vanderbilt, and uh, they have over 1,000 publications on the work they have done, and here are the centers that are actually participating in eMERGE. Now, this is your SHARPEN. These are your same. IBM is part of this, uh, Mayo, Utah, and these are the other institutions that are participating in data normalization phenotype recognition and data quality and evaluation framework. So they understand that there is much more we need to do to improve our documentation or our strings that we are picking up in electronic medical record to be able to use it for research purposes. 
This is predominantly in EHR, electronic health record for clinical research. This is a public-private participation or partnership where they are trying to identify patients that meet particular phenotype or genotype. One of the main reasons for that is this whole concept of personalized medicine. And a lot of institution wants to do personalized medicine with N of 1. You can't do that. Okay, the biological therapies, there are hundreds of them that are sitting on shelves. And the challenge is to identify that particular genotype that is so rare where that drug could work. And you need millions and millions of patients. That's one of the reason that Watson that was partner, partnering with MD Anderson, they were not able to have enough patient to be able to participate in those clinical trials. So the only way you can do personalized medicine that you have a nationwide directory of patients that pour in all the data and pick up those 20 who has that mutation, and then you can test that particular drug in those 20 patients. So that's what the issue is with personalized medicine. A lot of people say, oh, we do personalized medicine at place X or Y. It is very hard to do that. So that's the challenge with this. So there are system-based electronic health record some of the large complex EHR uh, are at Intermountain Healthcare. Most of you know about that. Baylor Healthcare System that is based of Dallas had a very nice integrated system, but now they are also moving into Epic. Uh, Mayo Clinic has their own system. Providence Health Services have their own system. One of the things they were trying to do is to look at how are we managing hypertension? Very simple, basic question and they were having hard time in identifying patients from different EHR that they want to study. Some people will write HTN, some people will type hypertension, some people will type BP, some people will type blood pressure. So it will be often hard to pick up, and then the challenge is, is it a discrete field or is it in free text? So then they just gave up. So they said there is no way that we are going to be able to have these four large system, and if we want to merge the data together, unless we have a unified data dictionary, it is very hard to move forward with that particular research. Now, there is something that is already on <clears throat> Hyper <clears throat> Cerner, as I mentioned, currently holds 26% of the EHR market share nationally, and the second one is Odyssey. Now, Cerner is a little bit different. I know we have all used Optum, or most of you have used Optum here, which is a, I guess, a proprietary name for United Healthcare uh, insured uh, patient population. Cerner, on the other hand, is based off of an electronic health record. So Cerner currently has Health Facts, which is a longitudinal data warehouse that you can able to get the identified uh, patient database over 480 health system that are part of the Cerner um, EHR there, and they can map a lot of different things. So currently, you can get pharmacy data, billing data, which is, I think Optum also have that functionality. You can get lab data, but it also now provides clinical data. So the good thing for us is, Elena, UT system do have um, a partnership with Cerner so they have reached out to us to see if we want to study a particular disease within the Cerner. The, chal the good thing with Cerner is this is all based off at a EHR level, so it doesn't matter where the patient is. As long as the client is Cerner, you will still have that longitudinal data. The challenge for us with Optum is the moment you leave that insurance, the patient is gone. So we lose almost 50% of the patient if we have to study anything longitudinally using, using insurance provider as their database. So I think Cerner database would be helpful if anyone of you are interested in studying something using that. We can reach out to UT system to see if they can help us with that. So next is this Odyssey. Odyssey is basically dumping every EHR that is available nationally. So it is Korean Teaching Hospital. They have 2 million patient record. Market scan that you guys use have 119 million record. If you add up all this, this is an international study of looking at different EHR and dumping data from different EHR. This is over 560 million patient data record from different insurance companies. One of the things they are interested in is to actually study what is the first drug that is usually started, what is the second drug, what is the third drug, depending upon the disease you are studying. Now, 
it is actually at a much larger scale. MIT is also partnering in this particular project. They are looking at three things, hypertension, diabetes, and depression. They are looking at what is the first-line drug, the second-line drug. They want to study the natural history of how the drugs are being prescribed. I think it is more beneficial for the pharmaceutical companies to understand how people behave, and it will also help when people are planning for a randomized control trials. What are the prior exposure to medication before you are randomizing patient to a drug A versus drug B as new drugs are being developed? So this is an odyssey where database that is available nationally. Now let's talk about UTMB. Uh, what are we doing here in terms of trying to see if we can use EMR, I'm going to stick with EMR, in terms of doing EMR for research. So our first um, forte into doing that was when we got our first CTSA award. So the thing at that time, we were trying to see can we easily identify a cohort of patient to see if they can meet a particular clinical trial that is available. So for example, I remember Dr. Volpe was very much interested in people at particular age group who are at risk for fall who could participate in the fall prevention trial. So one of the things that was promised was this I2B2 informatics for integrating biology and the bedside. So this is a proprietary out of uh, Pilgrim Health or Harvard, and they do sell I2B2 as their uh, product to able to see. And the whole idea there was to actually bring in data from different areas. So one of the things to understand, the data does not sit in one place in any health system. So your billing data resides in a different system. So even for example, you get an EKG. So you would think that EKG should be in an EMR. Unfortunately, it's not. It sits in the EKG warehouse. Only thing you get is a PDF document. The challenge is you can't study a PDF document. It's not a discrete field, okay? Same thing is imaging. Imaging sits in a different server. Billing sits in a different server. So one of the thing with I2B2 was that we will have all this system and we will have a clinical data warehouse where we'll bring in all this system and we will be able to provide de-identified data for folks who want to do different research, research thing. And we did try for a few, few things. I don't think it was a, a major success. Would you say that, Dr. Wolpe? So yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. It yeah, it didn't work. And another thing is you also need to know is to do the litmus test. So I think the CMS data is available to you guys for last 25, 30 years, okay? There is a lot of people who are doing that research. There are a lot of people who are validating that. The challenge is when you use a local health system data, nobody's validating it. So we did some stuff to learn about COPD. That was one of the original work we were doing. The number of patients we were getting on I2B2 was twice the number I was getting from Rick to run my reports. And I said, why is that? We don't have that many patients, and we get the data from CMS also on our Medicare patient with COPD. And you can have some idea, directionality, that they should be all within 5%. Okay, you can, it can't be exact, but it should be close. It can't be by twice the difference. That I'm getting 2,000, and I2B2 is giving me 5,000 patients with COPD. It turns out the way the data field was merged or brought in they were not aligned, so they were counting patients twice. So you almost have to be very careful when you're looking at this to see how the data is pulled. So the next thing was, is our CTSA version 2.0 was that we don't have enough patient within one system, how about we actually put together I2B2 from all the UT system, that was San Antonio, and that was also UT Southwestern. That was actually part of CTSA to put that, and we call that shrine. So this is institution one, institution two, institution three, and you basically pull the data from all of that, and this looks great graphically, okay? It's a beautiful picture. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that well. The challenge is because each EMR is very different. So you configure everything locally. So the way we will configure here may not be the same how EPIC was configured at UT Southwestern and how it was configured at UT San Antonio or Memorial Hermann system with UT Houston. 
So that was another challenge and people thought that if we merge it all together, it will make it easier. So I just think the shrine just sits in a shrine at this time and it hasn't moved anywhere. So this is, this is the thing. Now the third thing that is currently at works is called UTMB Discover. It is through Intermountain Health. There was a company that was offshoot of Intermountain Health called Health Catalyst. So we are actually doing similar to what was well, in I2B2, but in a much more robust way through UTMB Discover. And one of that is to build up a lot of different apps. And one of that apps is a research app. So some of you have probably participated in this. The, it's still uh, too early for me to say, but I think you can actually, if you want to say how many patients with COPD you have or how many patients we have with fracture, you can run that. It is not that easy to navigate some of these uh, screens because you need to really understand how to move a cohort from, I think most of you guys are used in using SAS so you can cut and size and dice the data the way you like, but this is not gonna be able to do all that. And you are not gonna be able to get the patient until you put an IRB into it. You will just get raw numbers. So, but this is a good tool that if something you are interested in, you can actually uh, look for and go from there. Now, what's going on at the UT Healthcare Enterprise? Now, UT is mostly interested in Visient uh, database. So Visient is a, it used to be called University Health Consortium. So all academic medical centers send their quality and outcomes data. That's how you get your ranking. So that's where we see our, uh, the information that we talked about best care. They give five-star ranking for the top 5% of the hospital. Then you get four star, three star, two star, and one star. So in the last year study, there were 107 academic health center. This year study is 96 academic health center. They have cut a separate group called Comprehensive Teaching Hospital, which means they don't have medical school. So if you have 96, that's per majority because there are about 130, 135 medical school in the U.S. So majority do participate in that. So UT system actually do have the data and they do benchmark, look at different UT system. The challenge is each UT system is different. Not every hospital is owned by UT. So for example, at UT Houston, it's Memorial Hermann system. It's not owned by UT. So that, and UT San Antonio is also a university hospital, but it's not owned by UT. So only one is gonna be UTMB, UT Tyler, and uh, MD Anderson, which is a cancer center, which is very different population. So they're doing some of these measures at a UT system level at this point. And I just mentioned to you that they do have Cerner now, Cerner database, the longitudinal fax database that we can use if we are interested in that. So, so what's going on locally is ideally what you want is that you, got, you go to different physicians, you go to different pharmacy, you got to go to different hospital. Ideally you want everything on a cloud that anybody can go to that cloud, able to extract that information and present it to you regardless of where you are. Okay, so this is called Health Information Exchange. Okay, so it's a Health Connect service area. This is our service area. If we look at it, we have 23 counties and these are some of our area. This is also a flag, which is our DISRIP, which is Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment, which is 1115 Medicaid Waiver Region 2 uh, Center. So this is Greater Houston Health Connect. So Nick was kind enough who gave me these slides. He's a CEO for Greater Houston Health Connect. So if you took, look into market share, these are the market shares of different health system in Greater Houston Galveston area. HCA is the largest one. These are your Clear Lake Regional Hospital. Mainland Hospital is an HCA hospital. They have about 30, 40 hospital in the area. So 23% of the market share in Houston, Galveston area belongs to HCA. The second is Memorial Hermann System, then Houston Methodist. We are at 3.7% because we are way out on the island. That's our region, that is our market share. Now, the challenge is how do we able to, if the patient moves from one system to the other, how can they be able to get that information right now? So this is their vision was to collect all the information from different areas, 
to able to provide it in cloud. So if the patient is at Memorial Hermann admitted to UTMB, we can get that information and see what is going on with the patient. This was predominantly built as a tool for patient care, but the goal is to actually be able to provide this for research purposes. So this is what their main uh, research committee's goal was, massive amount of clinical data diagnostic images and to explore some analytic capabilities within that database. Here is the team. Dr. Rutkin is here. She does participate in the Greater Houston Health Connect at this point. Now, this is some of the elements that are being currently pulled. It's basically an ADT field. ADT field is admission, discharge, transfer field. And those are some of the elements that are collected. So it is not that you've got to have vast amount of information in this. Okay, so it's very rudimentary in what data elements are collected. So you could have a patient in Beaumont, so during Hurricane Harvey, we were able to get some of the information on patients that came from Beaumont. So we were able to see what allergies they have, what medications they are on, any admissions, any hospitalizations, things of those nature. But you are not able to get the detailed information that you want to do for research purposes. So this is one of the projects that they are currently working on with Houston Methodist to look at the impact of socioeconomic determinants on hospital readmission. The hospital readmission is very tricky uh, because you are only going to capture what comes to you back to you. Okay, Only CMS knows where their patients are. So the best way to look at readmission is to look at Medicare data. So it doesn't matter whether the patient comes to you or to mainland or Texas City, they know that because they're paying those bills. The challenge is if the patient goes to other areas, you just look at your readmission, it may look great, but when you look at overall readmission at other institution, it may not look that well. And that's one of the challenges when you just look at readmission. We are doing fine uh, at our institution uh, overall, but we have challenge within Medicare population. Third of our Medicare care is actually outside of UTMP. So they may go to Clear Lake or Texas City because those hospitals might be closer to them. So they, ha they have this uh, consent model which is similar to other institutions that are doing. One of the challenge is for us is majority of our patient goes to HCA facility. They don't go to the downtown facilities. So if our leakage is, they are leakages to HCA. The challenge is HCA is not on Health Connect. So for us, from patient care standpoint, we want HCA on the same table. Actually, Nick's coming tomorrow. I'm meeting with him, and he is a big proponent that we should be doing this. The thing for us is that HCA has to be on the table if you are doing it for a patient care standpoint. And there's an actual month yearly fee to be part of health information exchange. But the good thing is if you're part of health information exchange, you can actually use that data for research purposes. All right, so let me give you one example. So if you've seen one EMR, you've just seen one EMR. One of the things we were doing with uh, Winston is that we said, okay, we want to study pulmonary hypertension, and we want to look at how good are we in terms of ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes to identify patients with pulmonary hypertension. Now, it's a rare disease. People won't put this diagnosis just for regular hypertension. You really have to think through when you put these codes in. So First order of business was people thought that ICD-10 is going to save us because rather than 10,000 code, now you have 40,000 codes, okay? <laughs> the problem is, as clinician, what's happening is people are not picking up the right codes. They're picking up everything unspecified. So if you want to do a study, you've got to do a study on unspecified. You know, you're going to get that as one of the things, and it's easy, is it? You know, when you finish your seeing a patient, you have 20 notes to write, was it right lower extremity DVT or was it left lower extremity DVT? The easy was DVT non-specified. So that's the challenge there. Because otherwise what's going to happen is if you say right lower extremity DVT, you're going to get a query back from a coder saying that, hey, in the chart you said left and you're coding this way. You said, oh, why should I do this? Just pick up unspecified. That makes my life easier. I won't get a query. So that's the challenge with ICD-10 now that even though the intent was that it will be more specific, but I don't think people are using it what the intent was for ICD-10. 
ultimately we will get there, but I don't think we are there yet. So clinically, pulmonary hypertension is group is given as this group. Group one, two, three, four, and five. Group one is what you are interested in because that is the worst one, primary pulmonary hypertension, usually more common in women than in men, mostly in third or fourth decade. It's rare to have PAH later in life. So that was what we were interested in. And if you look at ICD-9, there are two codes. In ICD-10, there are four codes. But if you look at ICD-10 codes and what is clinical, there is no relevance there. ICD-10 is very different than what is out here. So that's the challenge with doing that. So we actually did do this study looking at our data. When we look at EMR, this is how the pay, our physicians were documenting pH and non-PAH. Look at different ways they are typing it. It goes back to the same thing, primary uh, pulmonary hypertension, primary pulmonary HTN, pulmonary arterial hypertension, we are using EMR to be able to come up with encounter diagnosis. So we wrote the paper, we did sensitivity, specificity, PPV, and PV, all the stuff that you guys have taught me. And then we said, then the, uh, the reviewer came back that they need to validate it. They said, it's one center, we want you to get it from somewhere else. So I called my buddy up at UVA, I said, hey, could you pull the charts for me, we want to validate it. They were nice enough, guess what, they only used two codes in their EMR in the validation cohort. So they only have primary pulmonary hypertension or other chronic pulmonary hypertension. So it tells you that everything is locally built. So when you start using EMR phrases, you really need to understand what is going on locally. So this is what happened. We actually did wrote the paper. The paper got accepted. It should be coming out. And we were trying to highlight the same issues that even though we are using encounter diagnosis, we are using ICD-9, but there is other simpler way how we can make it better. So how can we make EHR data useful for research? Okay, so that's our ultimate goal. So I think one of the main thing is to have interaction with clinician through feedback reporting. So I think this is so critical if we want to use EMR because currently a lot of people think EMR is predominantly used for billing purposes. It's not pr predominantly made for research purposes because you guys were never on the table when the EMR was built. It was built, okay, how many elements I need in my HPI, how many elements I need my in my review of system and physical exam to build a level five. So one thing that has happened with EMR, even though you have a sore throat, everybody's getting level four, level five billing because you have all those elements and the bill goes based on those elements rather than whether it is necessary or not necessary. So there's a lot of auditing that goes on to give physician feedback that if patient comes with sore throat, that's the focus. Just focus on sore throat, and it could be a level two visit, and that should be it. So I'm going to talk about all those five things that we're going to be able to address. So one of the things is interaction with clinician through feedback. So one of our original uh, study was to look at how we can improve care of patient with COPD using EMR. The idea is everything in EMR is calculated is captured as free text. So the way you can help clinician to capture everything is to create a flow sheet. So then it becomes a discrete field that you have to fill in. The problem is if you make everybody to discrete field, then they have to still write it in their note because you can't bill off of discrete field. It has to be in your note. So the one way we did was we created a disc, um, flow sheet, but we also provided them a dot phrase so they can bring in everything from a flow sheet into their notes, which was easy. Easy. So you can just say dot COPD, it will bring in everything that was captured so they don't have to do it twice. So it did help us some in terms of feedback. We were able to uh, publish a couple of papers related to improving compliance both in inpatient and outpatient uh, setting. The second thing is EHR-based registries. Now, we do currently do have registries for COPD, asthma, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. So we do have those registries that are built in. And the registries goes through a SNOMED coding system that if you have these, these, these encounter codes, it will belong to a registry A versus B versus C. We also have some registries for our ACO contracts or alternative payment model that we currently use it for quality improvement purposes in those areas. So I think it all depends upon what your question is and whether we can study that. So I can actually look at what percentage of our patient hemoglobin A1C is above nine. So I could have a dashboard where I can see at a system level what is going on. 
The next thing is natural language processing. A lot of the things that we do is free text. And the concern is it's very hard to tell provider, click this box, click this box, click this box, then go back, write your note. It's, it's awful. It's a lot of work for a physician to do that. And one of the challenge is how can we meet the need of patient care and also meet the need for pulling data? So one of our concern is, so um, in our district two, we have to say if you are obese, that we actually give you an education about diet and exercise and we capture it. Now you could write a free note that patient's BMI was 32 and was advised to exercise three times a week and eat healthy and was given a um, consult to a dietitian. That's perfect. The challenge is you can't capture it. So the reporting has to be based on that particular element and it's not captured discreetly. So we look very poor that we are not giving advice for people who are obese. Similar issue is for depression. So, and similar issue is for foot exam, that for all patients with diabetes, they have to have a foot exam. And foot exam has three elements. You have to look for thin filament, clinical exam, and also feel the pulses. Now, it will be in your note, but the only way you can report on it to have a discrete feel. So that's some of the challenges. So NLP is one way of doing that. So it basically runs through the engine and it picks up different uh, syntax that people type and then you can validate it on a large database. So we are currently exploring the possibility of can we use an NLP uh, to be able to report on some of those quality measures where we have to report for our third party pairs. So that's the uh, NLP I think would be helpful both for research. Next thing is patient-centered medical homes. The reason patient-centered medical homes is they actually capture everything in discrete field because they have to. So one of the way is you standardize templates and standardize care in a given clinic. And we do have patient-centered medical home within family medicine and they do capture all these things. And there are different elements across each one of those domains and I don't wanna go through each one of those right now. The next thing is episodes of care. This is gonna be a good thing from a bundle payment standpoint because you exactly know which patient population belongs in that episodes of care. So you can start with that and then follow these patients for 90 days. Everything that's gonna be captured there is gonna be clean. So you can pull data on episodes of care. The challenge is also again that if it is occurring, so let's say we have a patient who got a hip replacement at UTMB, then got an inpatient rehab at facility X, then goes to SNF at facility Y, then goes home, you will have no information on those facilities X and Y because we don't capture that information right now. Now there are companies out there that will do that for you. As you know, CMS just released 28 more bundles. So their next date for entering into bundles is August of 2018. So there is 28 more bundles coming out for different health system to participate and it looks like that's the only mechanism in terms of bending the cost curve is to put people in these episodes of care bundle. And Dr. Ottenbacher knows more about that than I do. All right, now let's talk about the good, bad, and the reality of EMR. Here's the good, lab results and clinical details. Okay, we got plenty of lab results. Majority labs are discrete field. You can pull anything you want, okay? Large sample. So plenty of patients within this. It's inexpensive, near real-time analytics. So one of the things with Health Catalyst apps that we have building, we should be able to get update overnight on any new patient, any new lab, any new variable that we are interested in. Then you can actually use natural language and processing to extract information on physician notes. That is something we are exploring right now. So that's the good thing about EMR. Here are the bad. Missing data. Now the challenge is some of People like myself are pretty bad typists, so I type with one finger, okay? So I could write obesity as O-S-B-E-I-T-Y, or O-B-E-S-I-T-Y, okay? Or O-E-I-T-Y, okay? The challenge is how do you train an NLP to pick up all those sentence structure? So that's another major issue that we are seeing that it does not have an autocorrect like Apple has, 
when we are typing, it should correct when you're dictating anything like that. So that's another challenge there. Out of network utilization. This is only going to be helpful if we participate in health information exchange. Otherwise, you are not going to get anything outside of your own EMR. Sample attrition over time, this is true with anything we're going to do, that you are going to have people moving from place A to place B, and in, incomplete integration of various rep, uh, reports within health system. This is so important because if you want to say, okay, I want to pick up patient who have right MCA stroke. Now, it sits in radiology. It's not a discrete field. It's a PDF document. You can't query that. So that's the challenge with the radiology, that's the challenge with echo reports, echo is not a discrete field. The first thing we did was when we got our UT system grant, we actually made PFT as a discrete field. So we brought FEV1, FVC and the ratio as a discrete field within the EMR so people can query it, how many patients I have with obstruction, how many patients have spirometry. So unless we build those interfaces, it's going to be very hard to query those, those um, databases. Now, here's the bad. It's more expensive compared to claims database. A lot of people think EMR is cheap. It is not cheap. We pay per user fee every year. So it's a fair amount of money that goes into to keep EPIC going. Natural language processing is not validated. So you actually have to validate in your own system to see how your providers are uh, using. If an NLP is validated at Memorial Hermann, it may not be the same way because we don't type the same way, we don't document things the same way. Prescription written not filled, that's always an issue. Uh, if you're looking for pharmacy stuff, you only know what prescription you have written, but you don't know whether the patient filled it. So you need pharmacy data to support that. Uh, economic variables are unavailable, but there is some, within Health Catalyst, we are bringing in financial data into the same system. And the payer specific analysis is not possible. And one of our challenge when we are looking at our alternative payment model for Blue Cross Blue Shield, patient could get care at uh, hospital A or B, we will not have that information. Only the payer has that information. So the idea is how can we bring that information in? So something they have to do. Here is the reality. So they are the new tools, they are not going away. The government have spent so much money, so we have to make it work. Ideally it was built for billing. I think a lot of people understand the concern and the frustration with it. Our goal is to make it better. It is not going to go away. And, and it's still a long way uh, how to link different data system uh, from other sources. So that's some of the work that is going on uh, right now. Uh, I was impressed that I was at a, a recent innovation meeting where Microsoft is partnering with Epic and they are doing a lot of artificial intelligence work using Epic database. Epic has millions and millions of patient records. And one of the fascinating things they're doing is, so if I see a patient with diabetes and they will look at that patient profile, they will see a patient with similar profile that has been cared for within EPIC system within the country. It could be another 20,000 patients. And they could say, hey, Dr. Sharma, here is a similar profile of a patient. This is how other providers care for this kind of patient. That is what's coming with the uh, uh, Microsoft AI. They were very interested in partnering with healthcare. This is what Epic is doing. So we have Epic, then Epic Connect, Epic Care Link, Care Everywhere, Healthy Planet. Healthy Planet is basically a way of connecting to data which is outside of UTMB. So that's kind of what our ultimate goal is. We are not there where we have added Healthy Planet completely. What Epic's role is that they want to make it cosmos. You know, this lady is very planetary, so she likes to come up with all these weird names. So what she want to do is all Epic, all Epic from everywhere sits at one level, just like a shrine for Epic. So they're going to have data on millions of patients that she is going to be able to provide that for predictive analytics. So there are folks at Cleveland Clinic who are actually already working because they have the large population within EPIC that they are doing some predictive analytics using this. So this is the Cosmos module inside based on millions of patients and interaction. I think this is going to be fascinating. It should be coming in in next couple of years. So I think the question to ask is whenever you're trying to say, should I go look at EHR or EMR to do research is what additional information I need that is not available in the administrative claims. I think that is critical before you go into EHR. You are basically exchanging one bad thing with another bad thing. You want to make sure you are clear 
what information you need that is not available in administrative claim. And how is that information captured? This is the second most important question. If it is a discrete field, then go for it. If it is a free text, then you move away from that because you are not going to be able to get that information. And whether it is moved through an interface, if they don't have an interface to move that information, we have a lot of these queries that, oh, we need all the echo reports where systolic ejection fraction is less than 30%. And I would say, good luck. I would, there's no way for me to query that with an EPIC because it's a PDF document. Then is the documentation across EHR similar? I just gave you an example of UVA and UTMB. For the work we did, it's very different how folks document in EHR. And is there a validated NLP? So if there are NLP available, I think that would be good for you to be able to get that data. So here's the last one, the believers and the skeptic. The believer be patients likes me, rapid learning. I think people who loves my chart, pairs keep score on me, precision medicine, billing. So these are all the believers, okay? And then here are the skeptics. And the skeptics basically say rapid misinformation, disorganized system, patient privacy, and biased results. So I think it all depends upon whether you're a believer or skeptic, but I think the EMR are here to stay, and it is our goal to actually make it better. I think from a research standpoint, there's plenty of opportunity within the EMR and the EHR world. And uh, one of the last thing is the world that is moving to from EMR, EHR, next is CHR. So EMR is electronic medical record, EHR is electronic health record, CHR is comprehensive health record. So this is the word that uh, EPIC is using. So in future, you will have a comprehensive health record. So regardless of where you are or where you get your care, you will be able to get all the information and they should be able to talk to each other. Right now, everything is proprietary. Cerner doesn't talk to EPIC. Even EPIC doesn't talk to EPIC. You know, so that's the challenge. So I think the future is to have a CHR and that is all I have. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.